They're they're all on YouTube. They are um, unlisted. I don't list them on YouTube, but they are on YouTube. Okay. So in general, can you tell me what you've been studying? What I you know I think that um, you know there's a couple of things out there. There's TDC. There's Apgar. There's um, Alana. There's a lot of good programs out there. Yeah. Sorry, that's my daughter. Um, so tell me what you've been studying. You can type it in if you don't want to talk. I need some conversation. Well, this, is, this is Yvonne. Um, actually, I haven't really bought any of the guys. Because it's it's really confusing. I mean, so many out there, and and so many promises, and I just haven't. I didn't when I took the test the first time. I just sort of just went back over um, information I had from my um, the program, the graduate program, and um, just other you know pieces. Listening to YouTube, um, that's it. But, you know, it's just so many out there that make so many promises. Um, and, and, and I, yeah, and I, I, I don't speak for anybody. Um, I think the information is out there. I think that the information is always out there. I think the problem many times is not understanding what the question is asking. Right. Um, so even as we go over these, um, we'll focus on kind of what the question is asking. Right. So I think that seems to be um the, the issue that most of my students have is understanding. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you. I have a little bit of everything. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to share. Okay, so you'll see that I have a little bit of everything. When I search PDFs, you'll see that I have most of the APGAR stuff. Um, I teach tutor for the NCE too as well. Um, I actually use the, the ASB Bachelor's one a lot um, just because there are a lot of questions down there um, that things that you should have known if you'd taken a bachelor's degree and I find a lot of people sometimes don't have difficulty with some of those questions. Um, so I use all, used um, APGAR and LEAP and TDC. Yep. Okay. okay. Um, so I use a lot. So what we're going to do today is just kind of go over just some, we'll do both. We'll do some questions when it talks about just the theorist. Um, and then I'll go back and I'll talk about, um, we'll do some questions. Okay. Um, so, and again, anything I have, you're more than welcome to. Most everything I have is on my Facebook page. Okay. Um, and again, this is the... Um, this is the, the BSW book, and I know that most of the things, when it comes to code of ethics, things like that don't change. So I like to kind of break it down. Um, and I've gone through this last week, um, and, and there's lots and lots of information out there regarding um, how you take the test. Um, I always, always say just assess before you act. You would never go to the doctor's office without assessing. That just would not happen. If you walked in, he wrote you a script, you'd be like, ask me what's wrong. So always, always assess. And the times that you don't assess is because there is a, an overwhelming feeling going on. I walked in and the cayenne is crying. They're so upset. Um, I cannot say anything. If I open the camera today and I was boohoo bawling, I would hope somebody would ask me, how are you doing today? What's wrong? Okay. Yeah. So those are kind of normal things. What would you do when you're sitting in front of the client? Don't read any more into the question that is in the question, okay? The vignettes can go on and on and on, and sometimes there are things that are throw you off, and sometimes there are things you have to know, but you have to know what the question is asking you. So that's like the biggest issue for most of us is what is it asking me, okay? Um, pretend like you've never worked in the field, that these are your basic, you know, your first day. Um, there's no trick to it. If it's, if it's four C's in a row, it doesn't really matter. It's just That's just the way it is. Um, it doesn't change. It doesn't get uh, harder. I get people think it gets harder if I get these wrong. And that doesn't happen either. Um, and I don't mean to, to minimize it, but I can tell you it's, it's really not that hard. Um, it's the cancer. What you're missing is what the question's asking you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's just talk about that in general. Okay. So these are my basic people when it comes to um, development. Does everybody know if I ask you who Freud was in his stages, who could tell me? Um, 
Okay. Um, I guess you would say the oral, mm -hmm. um, anal, the Latin, Latin, and gentle, um, gentle. It is genitalia. Oral, yes. anal, phallic, and genitalia. O A P L G. Um, if you need a way to, to answer that, O A P L G. Those are Freud. Okay. So any question on the test that talks about unconscious, um, <laughs> too many theories. How do you remember them all? You have to remember the other, the easy ones, the big ones, and there'll be tons on Freud. Tons, tons, tons. ID, ego, super ego, id, ego, is super ego. You are right. Um, so first of all, I'm just talking about his psychosocial stages of development. So Freud believed that if you were fixed, if you got stuck in this stage, you would be fixed and you would not be able to go on. So if you got stuck in the oral stage, your mother didn't breastfeed you long enough um, that you would have difficulty there. Um, he also believed that was where your ego developed. Your anal stage, of course, that is if you were potty trained too soon. Your phallic, latency, and genital. So O-A-P-L-G. I've heard oral, anti, phallic, latent, oral, anti, pretty little girl, um, but O-A-P-L-G. And Freud's a biggie. He's the father of our, our talk therapy. So a lot of questions will be on Freud. You'll get questions, not, not just the simple though. What they'll say is if a man is, uh, or someone is having a drinking problem or if he is overeating, what stage is he fixated in? So what stage would that be? You say a man? If a man, a adult, was fixated, according to Freud, if he was overeating, he was fixated in what stage? Oral. Oral, Oral. exactly. Freud said that if you um, got stuck there, then you would spend the rest of your life trying to fix it. So you'd spend the rest of your life trying to fix that. So he, of course, he blamed everything on, you know, our, the mothers. He only treated women. Um, he is the father of talk therapy. So despite a lot of his craziness, he really had a really, a lot of good ideas that have gone down through the fields. Um, one question I had was what stage was someone in if he is in a procrastinator? And what did you answer? Hmm. I had no idea. I had no idea. Of, I, I forget what I put down, but uh -huh. I, I, I was so floored by that. I, I was just like, how am I supposed to know that? How I would my guess would be anal? Um, because Freud believed that if, you know, if your, your sphincter muscle was tight and if you didn't learn to, to potty right, then you'd be stuck there. Um, so that would be my guess. If I had to look at the test, um, so you um, and we, we use the, the anal stage now. People who are very anal, their personalities are very just they're tight, tight, tight wound. Um, so that might be my guess. If it was a procrastinator, I probably need more than that in the question, um, mm. but that would be my guess. Okay, um, the phallic stage is divided into two: um, the boy and the girl. So the girl, the boy is what? When the boy is attracted to his mother, that is called. The octopus. That is called the Oedipus stage. And the girl? Electra. Electra. And I always remember her because she. I remember that from last woman. week. That's right. My woman is Electra. I <laughs> love my Electra. <laughs> okay. I, I, I always, it just stuck in my head. That's I supposed to. I want, I want you to hear my voice during that test. Okay. That's the whole goal. <laughs> okay. So again, those are Freud stages O A P L G. OK, so that's again. Um, and then when it comes to ages, um, if you've never had kids, um, you know, look for someone's kids. It's pretty easy to figure out. Freud is the only stage to start uh, that. I'm sorry. Freud stopped at 12. He believed that you from 12 on or sometimes 13. Um, but th the test is not that finite. We're not looking between 12 and 13. They'll give you like 10. They're not going to do that to you. Um, your oral stage is when you're breastfeeding, you're, you're bottle feeding. So that's um, the first year of life. Your anal is from two to three. Your phallic is three to five. Any question that talks about masturbation is three to five. Okay. That is when kids discover, you know, their penis and their vagina and how great it is. So any question about that is really about their phallic stage. And Freud would say that's where their super ego develops. The super ego is the no, 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 don't do that stage. So he would say that in the, uh, you're born with your id. Your it is your your basic instincts, your your need, your drives. Your it is uh, food. Sorry, your food, clothing, and um, food, food to eat, sleep, and procreate. Those are your drives. For those are the three things you're born with: eat, sleep, and procreate. Um, and everything else um, just is really about. Um, that's all the drives were. 
Okay. And then so my drives are going, 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 eat, 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 have sex, have sex, have sex, asleep. That's all my drives want to do. Okay. So he believes we're born with that. That's a natural drive. So then of course my ego develops when I am born. My ego is kind of the, and we say that's the, the one who, who decides what a little bit or not a little bit. Okay. Um, he's the one that kind of levels us out. And any question asked about who you're working with in the unconscious, it's always the ego. Okay. So your yeah. phallic is your, is your, that's when you're, is you're developing your sexual desires, your sexual, who you are. You're, you know, realizing that you have this great toy down there. Hi, I can play with it. Three to five, normal age. Um, so that's when your superego develops. Your superego says, stop doing that. Don't do that. And your ego is like, but it feels good. And your superego is like, no, 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 no. Now, your ego is already developed. Freud would say it's not fully developed yet until you get a little bit older. Um, but your ego develops in the oral stage. So he says all this is going on the whole time. Your ego is going, yes, 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 let's do this. Um, and I think most of us can get used to that, that whole kind of women thing. I want to eat, 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 eat. And my superego says, no, Pam, you cannot. And then my ego says, well, you can have one piece. It won't kill you. So that's kind of how they work together. Um, and then your latency stage, nothing happens, nothing at all. And if you can actually relate that to the human development, um, the year before people actually show their secondary sexual organs, that's when, before girls start their period or before boys get like the deep voice and, you know, the hair on their pubic, their pubic hairs, a year before nothing is happening on the outside. All those hormone changes are happening on the inside. So the latency mm. period, nothing happens sexually in, in Freud stage, which matches up biologically with nothing visibly happening in, in a kid stage. So then when that genitalia stage comes out, your genital, that's when we see kids who have gone through that finished puberty. Okay. Mm. So if a medical doctor will tell you that, you know, usually about when you, you know, you, about a year before you start getting the, the stinky stuff, that's when the kids kind of go into puberty. So that's how I remember uh, latency, nothing happens. O-A-P-L-G, oral anal phallic latency gentle, or um, orphan any pretty little girl, but O-A-P-L-G, O-A-P-L-G, okay? Um, and genitalia is anything with sex. Any question about sex? A grown man is having difficulty um, performing according to Freud. It would just definitely be about his, his genital stage, okay? Um, so, of course, we know that Freud also has the defense mechanisms. We'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, the truth is those those came from Anna. Uh, Freud f gets credit for them. They actually came from Anna, so Anna, who did that. Okay. And again, those are the ages. And you'll get this. It's recording right now. In addition, you'll get a copy of it when we're done. Okay. Erickson's model, of course. We talk a lot about Erickson. He has eight stages. Um, we did this a little bit last week as well. Um, I always suggest that you find where you're at and go up or down. Those of you who had me before, what stage am I in? Anybody? What stage am I in? Oh, gentle, gentle teller. Activity. I'm in. I'm in. And we're not going to Erickson now. I'm in the generative oh. stage. Yeah. Okay. So I am 40 to 65. Uh, generativity means giving back, continuing to grow, continuing, continuing, or stagnating. So there are lots of people who are my age or my friends who are choosing to stagnate. They're kind of done. They're at the end of their career, and they're done. That's really okay. Um, I'm choosing to generate, to be considered to go and, and to give back. It also means generations to give back. And if you look at this age after me, it's integrity versus despair. So those are those people on, my de on their deathbed. Um, and people who definitely are on their deathbed and maybe not feeling like they've made the right choices, um, feel like that they have um, not made the best choices and they're looking back. So ego is happy and despair is kind of, ah, I can't do this. Okay. So um, 21 to 39 is intimacy versus isolation. According to Erickson, that if you, that's when you're supposed to find a relationship and live happily ever after. However, if the stage before, when you're in, in, in identity, your teens, your, young, your teens and early 20s, if you didn't figure out who you were, you didn't know who to love. So if you didn't know if you like boys or girls or cats or dogs, that whole identity stage it wouldn't happen. You wouldn't be able to find anyone that you really liked, that you were interested in. Okay. And then, of course, my autonomy, my, my uh, industry, industry versus inferiority. People always get those ages confused. So industry are my first graders. My kids are starting school. That's when you figure out what you're good at. 
your industry. So whatever your town you live in has a great industry. So this is what helps you figure out who you are. Okay. Um, and then, so I've talked about before, you know, when you were in elementary school, um, you knew the kids who weren't good in school, right? The kids who, who weren't the smartest. That was obvious, right? <laughs> yeah, it was. And it's just a fact. There were some kids school wasn't their thing. You also knew the kids who got picked last on the, 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 the sports teams, right? Mm -hmm. That was me. That was me. I was not the sports team. <laughs> that's your industry. That's what you're figuring out in those ages. So if you don't figure out your industry, then that whole part of figuring out your identity, it gets difficult. And, and that's really what he believed is that um, every part led on another. So if you didn't figure that out, then you, you'd be stuck. Um, so that industry, that gets confusing. Remember those elementary school kids, what they were good at. Remember yourself when you were in elementary school. Like, oh my gosh, sixth, seventh, eighth, when you were like the base, baseball player ever, that's your industry. Okay? And then, of course, before that's my initiative versus guilt. Those are my three to five-year-olds. And what we know at that age is those three to five-year-olds want to help. They want to help. Um, they can't wait to help. Um, and then also then my... Um, autonomy versus shame, and then my infants, which is the uh, trust versus mistrust. Okay, I'm pretty sure that's a review for most of those. Kohlberg is my other big guy. Okay, um, we talked about Piaget and his um, sensory motor. Can anybody name those for me off the top of your head? Piaget's? Um, um, sensory motor. Um, let's see, yeah, the pre operational, mm -hmm. um, concrete, mm -hmm. and last, so, um, formal. Perfect, you get the bell. <laughs> Yay, <laughs> good job. Mm -hmm. So, those are, those are his stages. Um, and yes, yeah, so what he believed was that if you didn't go through those stages, of course. Uh, I'm sorry, that's, that's how you develop. So he's a cognitive development person. So when you look on the test and you see about intellectual or thinking development, those are always, always Piaget's, okay? And one of the things that, um, let me get my picture here. There we go, I like this one. That just helps me figure it out. I'm a very audio uh, visual person. So if I look at this one, then it helps me remember that that sensory motor stage, they're walking around, putting things in their mouth at that age, trying to figure out like what's going on, um, touching, touching everything, all their senses. That's what they use. Um, the pre-operational stage, that is um, where they believe in Santa Claus and they think the tooth fairy is amazing. They think you're amazing. They've got a, 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 a imaginary friend sometimes. In the sensory motor stage, object permanence develops. What is that? Um, thinking, uh, when uh, realizing that, um, okay, your mother leaves the room, but you know that she still exists. You got it. You got it. And that happens about seven months. That is pretty much across the board. Any question on the test talks about when that happens. So that's pretty much across the board. Okay. Um, then my concrete stage. Concrete is very hard. They're very factual about things, very factual. And then uh, my formal is when they can do adult thinking abstract. Um, again, SPCF, SPCF, SPCF. Um, but if the question, if it was just that simple, would be great, right? But the questions always ask you then, you know, if they're in this stage, what does it mean? So you have to know the stages to be able to kind of answer the questions on what those stages mean. Okay. Um, my formal stage, I remember in my concrete, um, they can figure out um, my times, my math tables. Those are really, really easy to do. However, when it comes to my formal operational state, they sometimes have difficulty with figuring out some of those things. Okay. Um, and you'll notice that Kohlberg's theory is look very much like Piaget's because uh, Kohlberg, my, my um, moral development, he was a follower of Piaget. So he really was able to um, mimic his stages after um, Piaget's. Okay. So when it comes to my behavior, guys, Skinner and Pavlov, what's the difference? Um, 
stimulus. Um, um, come on, um, come on. Classical, classical uh, stimulus response. Who does that belong to? Uh, Pavlov. Yes, bingo. That's Pavlov. So Pavlov rang the um, bell and the dog began to saliv salivate. Um, so what we know is um, that is classical conditioning. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and we are very much classical conditioned to the things today. Um, everybody got that little phone that you're conditioned to? Before everybody had their own little phone, you know, that little ring didn't mean nothing. And now everybody's got a phone and you know who it is before it rings, right? Got that little name set up with their special ring. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you know exactly. And you don't have to look at it anymore, right? Right. Oh, yeah. So what happens with us when we are, we are is so if it's, um, if it's someone that maybe I really want to talk to and my phone rings, I get that smile on my face before I even look at it. Like, oh, that's my boo. And I even looked at the phone, right? I've got that feeling just by that sound because I've paired that person with that sound. That's what classical conditioning is. Okay. And on the other hand, when, I don't know if your kids were little, if it said, you know, your kid's school, you had a feeling too, even before you answered the phone. Because you paired that with something else. And that's all Pavlov did is he classically conditioned us. So we are, we are still very much conditioned today that we learned that, that, you know, things happen and we, we begun to, to pair that with things. Okay, um, so the the difference between classical and operant is operant is with rewards and consequences only. Okay, so classical conditioning is Pavlov, uh, consequences and rewards belong to Skinner. Okay, who was my first my first behaviorist? Mm. That was um, that John Watson. What did he do? Yeah. Was it the uh, Bobo? Close. That was Bandura. Close, though. Yeah. Bandura did social learning theory. John yeah. Watson ta terrorized little Albert. Yeah. Okay. So he really did. Um, if you ever see the term tabla rosa uh, on there, um, that means blank slate. And um, John Watson is the father of behavior theory. And what he said is, give me, your, give me anybody. Give me your little um, you know, babies, and I can train them to do anything. Um, he said, I can make them a doctor, lawyer, whatever. He believed babies were a blank slate and you could train them to do anything. Um, and this, this nurse, this little Albert's mother said, okay, here, take my baby. He said, see what happens. <laughs> um, poor, poor woman. Um, but of course, if you've, I'm sure you've seen the experiment before, and if not, you can always Google it. Um, he was not afraid of anything. He was not afraid of anything at all. He, the animals were fine. The rabbits, the big dog was fine. It was a horse. He was fine. He was fine. And what happened is then he paired it with a very loud, awful sound. So whenever um, a little a sound came along, there was this huge gong um, and little Albert became terrified. So um, yeah. at the end, he was even terrified of Santa Claus because he, he um, generalized that white fuzzy beard to an animal and he was terrified of Santa. Um, you can video him, Google him also at the end. Um, he died in like an insane asylum I mean, really messed him up forever. But he is the yeah. father of behaviorism and that is John Watson. Okay. Um, and now, of course, what he, what he did was illegal and we wouldn't do that again. Um, but he did. He did. So he's actually an interesting guy. He's, we've got a lot of stuff from him, but um, he, he, he's, he changed a lot of lives, that's for sure. Okay. And you mentioned Bandor. He is my social learning guy. So mm -hmm. when we talk about names, I try to divide them up into who does what. Okay. So we know that Skinner and Pavlov and Watson are all my behavior people. Okay. And then we know that when it comes to cognitive development, that's Piaget. Um, and then when it comes to, go back to my test here. Oops. And then when it comes to, um, there we go. Go back to my drive and start over. So those are my big guys. Anybody have anybody um, that's not one of the big guys that we've hidden, we talked about a little bit? Those are my big guys.
Okay. Um, Lev Vygotsky? Does he ring a bell? Yeah, the name. I forgot. Lev Vygotsky is scaffolding and my zone of proximity. Okay. Oh. So what he talked about was that we learned um, by our surroundings. It's called ZPD. And I remember, uh, it's easy for me to remember because it's Lev Vygotsky. With all those letters, he needs a ZPD in that name. And he's also got um, scaffolding. So what he said is in his scaffolding is there's an area where I understand I can do by myself. But the bigger my zone, I learn through scaffolding. I add on and I add on and I add on. And then sometimes there are skills that I just can't, they're out of my reach. But if somebody helps me, then I can add on and add on and add on. So Lev did ZPD, zone of proximity and the term scaffolding. Those come from Lev. Okay. A zone approximal. Okay. I think those are my big guys when it comes to it. So we're just going to kind of answer some questions. So I'm going to do, and um, um, this is a site that is totally free. Um, I just think it's fun to do, and I need some audience participation. So if you go to cram.com, okay, and actually I'm going to switch sharing my screen here for a minute so we can switch screens and share. Um, we're just going to kind of find a cute way, a fun way to answer some of the questions. Okay, so I'm going to. Any questions out there? It's so quiet. I hate it when it's quiet. Can you hear me, Pam? I can hear you. Go ahead. Um, so I know that this is too much to re-explain, but what did you, like, can you give a brief sum summary of what you said about classical conditioning again? I sure can. I sure can. So Pavlov is the father of classical conditioning, okay? And what we are, and in society, we are paired, we have learned to pair something. So he used the terms like um, stimuli and respondent. Those were his terms. So my, my phone, and what he did is with a dog, my phone right now, um, before it was my phone, those sounds and things meant nothing. They meant absolutely nothing to me, okay? So, you know, we never didn't have a cell phone. We might have heard a phone ringing. It meant nothing. Now, um, every time that I have, I've paired something good or something bad with that sound, I don't even have to look at my phone. I get that. I elicit that feeling just from the sound, whether I see it or not. Mm. That's what he did with the dog. So he had the, the food and he had the bell. Okay, and they, it meant nothing. That they meant nothing to each other. So what he did is he rang the bell, and when he rang the bell, he paired that with the food. So eventually, he took the food away and rang the bell, and then the be dog just began to salivate just because he rang the bell. So that is classical conditioning, and most of us today are still very much classically conditioned. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Sorry, it's Chanel okay. that said that. Okay. So <laughs> then, what is the the now what how, differentiate that, that for me for, from um um uh, operant conditioning? What's the difference? All right, y'all. Now you got to help me because I don't. <laughs> Come on, she took a stand that. out there. Come on, <laughs> somebody get her back. The operant has um, rewards and punishment. Okay. So that's how operant works. It is only, and he would say rewarding consequences. So that the question always comes up though, is that um, the issue of uh, negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement. Do I know what those are? Um, I'm gonna start. I think the positive reinforcement um, helps to increase the behavior. Okay. And the okay. negative okay. Um, reinforcement, you want to decrease the behavior. Okay, so all reinforcement, um, uh, all reinforcement increases behavior, whether it's right. negative or positive. All reinforcement okay. increases behavior. Gotcha. So then the difference is, okay, I'm going to stop sharing and switch screens here. 
switch screens. Okay, so you should say that screen. The difference is, is what I give or take. Um, and like I, if I could tell you, um, this is probably um, something I spend the most time teaching. It seems to be, because um, that's not how we've n ever heard it. Okay. And I, I, I don't mean, I'm not saying I don't mind teaching it, but it, it's just, a, it's a very hard for most of my students to get, and, and I understand why. So that's kind of, so in general, okay, so do you see my, my screen with the, come on up. There we go. The plus and minuses. Is that what you're saying? Oh, gotcha. Mm -hmm. You see, is that what you say? They're orange and the green? Yeah. Okay. So, um, in general, anything we do, anything we do reinforces behavior. Anything that's a reinforcer, whether we give or take away, reinforces a behavior. Okay? So then um, I can give you something or take away something to reinforce your behavior. So if I said to you, oh my gosh, you guys are so amazing. You have worked so hard. I tell you what, I'm going to write the, um, the social work board and I'm going to tell them you study so hard. You don't have to take the test. Okay. Would that be negative? <laughs> that would be a dream. <laughs> would that be negative or positive reinforcement? Positive. How? Oh, wait, no. No, that's um, negative. Taking away us having to take the exam so it would be negative. Exactly. I'm took. I'm taking something away. Would that reinforce your behavior to study? No. I told you no. That you had to keep studying. If you, as long as you kept studying, you didn't have to take the test. Right. Right. You would. You would keep studying. Because if I told you, if you keep studying, you don't have to take the test. Correct. Don't. And this is my fantasy world. Okay. Because I'm reinforcing your behavior to study. So I'm taking that away from you. I'm taking away the test. Okay. Well, so in elementary school, if you have little kids, so sometimes at a spelling a spelling test, and the teachers give a spelling test out of the words out on Friday, and then on Monday, if you came in and you took the spelling test and you got it all right, you didn't have to do the homework for the week. So what was that? That um, negative punishment. Negative, yeah. Is it a punishment? I don't have to do any homework. Oh, negative reinforcement. Yes, yeah. negative reinforcement. Yes, I don't have to do the homework. Yay me, yay me. Okay, mm -hmm. so if I come in on Monday and then I took the spelling test and I missed 12 words and then she gave me not only the regular homework, she gave me additional homework. What is that? Positive punishment. Positive. Is it punishment or is it a reinforcer? Uh, that's... um. So she, what she wants me to do is pass the test. So what's reinforcing my behavior? I'll give them more. Okay. So the goal is to, is she wants me to study. So that is right. reinforcing my behavior by, she's giving me something, but she's still reinforcing my behavior. Positive is extinction to, I'm sorry, punishment is extinction to stop the behavior. Okay. So give me an example of a negative punishment. When, um, you. when you're late to curfew, your parents ground you. What did you take away? Their ability to be out until... <laughs> my freedom, time. right? <laughs> exactly. You took away my freedom. That's negative punishment. You took something away. Someone said spanking. That's positive punishment. You're giving me something. Giving a spanking. <laughs> that is positive. So... Punishment consequences always, always, always decrease behavior. So reinforcement always, always, always increases behavior, whether it's given or taking. Okay. So that was a difficult concept. So you just have to really spend time with that and kind of let it sink in. Okay. Because they're, they're, they're again, they're not going to be that simple when it comes to the questions. So. Yeah. <laughs> Got one of those. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So then. Um, let's see here. So I'm going to show you this. We'll do this for a couple of times before we go any qu do questions. This is just a really, really fun way to learn. Has everyone done CRAM before? Mm -mm. Okay, so it's cram.com. Um, and you'll see there's a couple up there that are by me. You'll see either my name or um, academic coaching. However, uh, most of them are just really fun. It doesn't have to be mine. Um, but it's a totally free site. If you go to cram.com, you can put in any subject you want to put in. Um, and then um, when you pick the subject, so I picked LCSW, it'll actually show you the words that are on. 
There's no cards in that set. Okay, so you can, there's all these here to study. And um, let's see here. So LCSW review, let's see. And then if you look down, okay, you see the words. Okay, so those are the words you'd be studying. Okay. So you can always play this one. That one's not mine. Let me just give you. Okay, so again, you see the words? Okay, so those would be the words that you're studying. So as you're looking, you can find one that has words that are the terms that you want to study. Okay, so let me go back one more time. And if you want to do one yourself, you just click create flashcards. You can actually create your own. Oops. And again, you put in anything, and you'll come up and you'll see there's just tons and tons added. Okay, when you're looking, there also tells the date. Um, so sometimes it says the date and the author. So you can, you know, look for the ones that I've done, or you can just look for whatever ones you want. Again, they're just fun. Um, okay, so click on it. It'll tell you what words are in there. Okay. So, and then what I, I like to play the game because it's fun, so I do need your input. Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to tell me which, which um, is on the right side that matches the one on the left side. Okay. So the way that it works is there are, um, they're probably gray looking to you. Um, they're grayish and the ones are of color. So if you can tell me which one matches which on each side. So then just say, you know, um, shout out the one avoidant behavior is this, or this is this. Um, and what I want you to do is not get stuck. So if there's one you don't know, just skip it. That's why I want you to do it on the test. Um, don't spend any time on things you don't know um, because you get frustrated and you think I'll never get this. Okay? So, just tell them, shout out then when you find two that match. And you can tell this is old because it has axis three. You can tell that's an old one because we don't do those axes anymore. Arriving at the same point through different approaches, techniques, and routes. Anybody know what that term is? That is a family systems term, and it's equal finality. So that is a systems term. Arriving at the same point through different approaches, techniques, or route. Equal finality. Okay. Come on, be brave. I just didn't hear it. Try it again. Produce um, produces highly unpleasant side effects. And that goes to what? Uh, what is an abuse medication? You got it. Good, good. Thank you. Get a bell. Um, and abuse is considered aversion therapy because it is so gross. If you don't know, if you, it's a pill you took before you drink and you throw up violently afterwards. So that term is aversion, A-V-E-R-S-I-O-N, aversion therapy. Okay. What are we mandated to report? Child abuse, elder abuse, suicide risk? Bingo. Yes. What's a reaction formation? That's one of those Freudian things. What is that? When you react in the opposite um, of your feelings. Okay. So do you see one that makes sense? Kind of, the words are small. 
Yeah. It's that one. Mm -hmm. Person adopts attitudes, attitudes, behaviors that are opposite of those he harbors, consciously or unconsciously. Excessive um, morale, but repressed associate implies or being excessively sweet or unmasking anger. Is that reaction formation? Sounds like it. Yes. There you go. What do diagnosis always be meds? Schizophrenia, bipolar. You got it. What's the medication of choice for schizophrenia? Um, Haldol. Haldol would work. Thorazine. Any of those antipsychotics. And what is a side effect of some of those antipsychotics? Audio conditions. There you go. Tardive dyskinesia. That is it. Makes my mouth go strange places, strange things. And what is the drug of choice for bipolar? Lithium. Lithium. Yes. Lithium requires what? Blood test. You got it. Bingo. Blood work. Good job, guys. Good job. Okay. How about formal operations? That belongs to Piaget. That looked like this one. I'm oh, sorry, is it 15 year old? That was my formal. Yes. And I'll give you access two since we don't have that anymore. Access three. Those are any general medical conditions that were on there and that we don't do an access system anymore. Uh, rationalization to make sense of something, given a believable explanation for irrational behavior. Very good. That's one of my defense mechanisms. Where do you see that most often? Um, mm, maybe with substance abuse users. You bingo. Um, most often, though, if the question is about substance abuse, it's really going to be a denial question. I see that a lot also in subs. I'm sorry, domestic violence situations. She deserved it. She didn't make dinner right, so I had to hit her. That's sometimes we'll see that one in that situation. You got it. Okay. For peas, person, problem, place, something else down there. <laughs> it goes to Perlman, Fritz Perlman, right? <laughs> what about that PIE? What does that mean, guys? This one. In environment. <laughs> Oops. Repeat. Person environment. You got it. So which one of these is it match? Uh, that is my ecology. Yes. You got it. Ecology. That's what that is. Uh huh. Well, the avoid. I can see the rest of it. Yep, I got that gestalt theory. Thank you, Jenny. You're absolutely right. Sorry for making down. Looking at um, so holistic treatment of the uh, personal development, psychotherapy, individual. Okay. Well, that definitely is a feeling addresses feelings of inferiority. Who does that belong to? Oh, shoot. Um, Eric Erickson? Nope. No, inferiority no. always belongs to Adler. Yes. Um, Adler's yeah. birth order, yeah. and, and he talked about inferiority. So if you look at the birth order of things, one of the things he talked about was because you, one times you felt inferior because of your birth order. I was yeah. thinking the age stages. Okay. The middle age, the middle child. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yes, okay. So <laughs> I'm the oldest. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, the con concept of interacting parts with boundaries, of course, that's my systems theory. Okay, mm -hmm. that family systems theory, all of those terms. Go back to that. Mm -hmm. So let's just make sure you know those. Homostasis is, is just um, the way it is. Homostasis is yeah. routine, normal. Okay, yeah. so these are all terms that are gone from this outside system that now we use in family. So what is input and output?
Anybody. Energy. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in a family, in an environment, in a system, shouldn't we have input? Yeah. So what happens is um, if we do not have, boundaries are known to be systems. They're very open or closed systems. So if we have a closed system, let's say that we have a mother and a father um, and they have two children and the two children never get married. What eventually will happen to that nuclear family? It'll be closed. Um, yeah. It'll die. It'll die. Because yeah. if the kids don't marry and there's no, they don't let anybody in, that, that nuclear family will die. So yeah. input is letting people in, letting you know, the son and daughter marry people, um, you know, having friends over. That's input. Output is what the family would put out. So if the family, you know, is involved in the church, they're involved in the community. So whatever comes out of that system is their output. Okay. Thorough put is what goes through. So thorough put is what goes in the system, out the system, and through the system. Okay. So those are systems terms that we now use for family systems therapy. Okay. Okay. And then some other terms that we use many times. Okay. Those are my boundaries, the importance of having open and closed boundaries. So we see that subsystems, the whole family should be a system, right? We work together. However, there should be parental subsystems. Mom and dad should be a system and the kids should be a system. Those are all part of those important boundaries that we have to have. Okay. And I said before, so input from the environment and then output to the environment is what this system is supposed to produce. And the input and the output is the thorough put. Okay. I asked you before, what happens if this system closes and gets no more input? And what did you tell me? It will die. Okay. The word for that is entropy. It entropy. will entropy. Oh, yeah. It's entropy. what my plants do when I don't feed them. <laughs> they yeah. entropy and die. <laughs> okay. So that is, that is what that term is, entropy. Okay. Negative entropy is a good thing. Negative entropy means it's not going to die, it's going to live. Negative entropy is a very good thing, okay? Um, the question before, we talked about equal finality. Do you remember what that was? So finality is the end. Equal finality means we all get to the end. We just might get there different ways. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and it's used many times in family therapy, but I think all of us in life have gotten to this point where we have a master's degree at least. Uh, and did we all not get here different ways? It's true. Okay. That's equal finality. So when you're looking at that room, taking your test, everybody got there different ways, but they all got there. That's all that means. Okay. And then feedback, of course, is what that system gives, gives out or gives to each other. So all these are terms of systems theory. Okay. Who does this belong to? He doesn't believe in the repressed group and he uses the empty chair. Gestalt. 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 Uh, Dr. Phil uses a gestalt. He'll say, how's that working for you? And then he'll say, pretend like I'm the chair. Or the chair is your mother. Just sit down and tell me what you want to say to your mother. The gestalt is one of the things that he, he uses. Okay. Um, timidly avoiding establishment of new strangers. May have strong relationships at home. That's my avoidant behavior of that personality. And loss of motivation, of course, are my inhibitions. So, again, that is cram.com. So you can go there anytime just to practice by yourself. It's lots of fun. Just just check it out. Okay. Sure. So Great. let's do some other questions. Questions you want to ask me in general? Okay, I'm just gonna go. Okay, so.
is this one. Let's go to some app bar. You see my screen? Yes. Okie dokie. Um, if you've used this book before, I'm going to try to start maybe in the middle so that way we're not getting all of the... Okay. Thirty-one. Um, and again, you can type in the chat box if you want. If you don't feel like shouting out, feel free to type in the chat box and we can discuss it. A client reports that she was recently fired from her job um, based upon her religious beliefs. She's intimidated by the thought of taking action against her former employer, and she does not believe that she will be successful in fighting the bias against her. She feels depressed and hopeless in formulating a treating goal the social worker should. Okay. A, identify whether antidepressant medications may be needed. B, determine the impact of her current emotional state. C, complete a suicide risk or assessment. Or D, assist the client in fighting the discriminatory practices of the client. Okay. Would someone be brave enough to kind of talk me through the process of how you would answer this question? No. No. <laughs> uh. I'll shoot for it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, well, the first thing um, um, I'm looking at the client that um, she feels um, hopeless. Okay. Um, so um, what I would do or should do, um, I will first assess her for safety. What um, in there makes you think she needs suicidal? Um, because she feels hopeless. Um, she doesn't feel um, like it's a no win in um, pursuing the case. Um, so she I, feels. I see that, but I'm not really sure I see enough to to complete a suicide risk and assessment. Okay. I, f I see where you're going. She feels depressed and hopeless. I just don't think that I there's enough in that question to to, to for mm -hmm. me to go. And all I'm looking at is what the question asks. Remember that, okay? Um, okay. I, I'd not seen that yet. Mm -hmm. um, somebody else share. Or keep going. Other thoughts? Um, re can you read the question again? I sure can. I can make it bigger, too, if I need to. I can, I Go can ahead. see it. I can make it much bigger. <laughs> Better? Old people, yes. I got it. I got my old people <laughs> font on. I am no problem. <laughs> um, much better. Thank you. Not a problem. Okay. Okay, so what's the question asking me? In formulating her treatment goals, I should. So, okay, that's make sure we understand what I'm doing. Um, it's, um, uh, let's see, I'm formulating her treatment goals. So I'm assuming it's probably, it doesn't say it's the first time I've seen her, but I'm, I'm going to assume we don't have a really good relationship yet, right? Nothing there that says that. Um, what else? Go ahead. Well, um, B would kind of determine, would kind of be completing that assessment. So I would say B, determining her current emotion state so that you can assess to be able to formulate those treatment goals. Okay, so what is she coming in for? I think I would actually, she needs, um, um, and she's coming in actually for support. I would think also um, because She's she appears to be powerless and advocating for herself. Okay. So. Um. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, thinking that the social the social worker would basically um, act as an advocate for her, okay. as motivating her to fight for um, her social justice. Okay. Okay. And so the answer would be. I would choose. I would choose D. Yes! yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <I'm>, okay. <laughs> day I wouldn't do this. <laughs> I don't care in the real world for the test. Okay. Yes. So what is yes. the client coming in for? Does she come in because she's depressed? Right. Right. You're right. Okay. She's intimidated by the thought of taking action against her former employer. And she does not believe that she, that, that she doesn't believe. They fired her based on her religious beliefs. That's illegal. 
So that's the problem. That's illegal. That's the problem. Our code of ethics says we're going to fight for those. Right. So this is, a, this is the code of ethic question. Okay. It really is. We are going to fight for her. So there's nothing in her. Yes. Yes. It looks like that she has a little, she's a little depression maybe, but nothing that says me that she's suicidal. Okay. So, you know, of course, always I'm going to assess. That was where we were going. So, well, you know, we, there's no feelings in there. I'm looking to see, do I need to assess anything? Um, so as I'm assessing, I'm reading through, let's rule out. There's nothing in there that she needs medication. I'm determined the impact of her current emotional state. She told you. She's depressed and hopeless. A complete suicide risk. I don't see enough in there. It's illegal. She's recently fired from her job based on religious beliefs. Okay. The answer is D. Okay. Comments on that? I question wrong because <laughs> it kind of throw, throws you off the helping process when they start talking about um, hopelessness. It does. It sure does. It put, they're throwing in there tricky purposely. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But is there enough in there to, to tell me that that's just not enough in there to say that? Okay. She's hopeless because she's, she, she, she does not believe that she will be a success in fighting the bias against her. That's why she's hopeless and depressed. Okay. So is that what you call reading into the question too much and assuming something? Or? Yes, yes. Only read what's there. Only read what's there. Okay. And don't go down the road of where you think it's going to happen. Only read what's there. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I always say, you know, I don't know if we read the Bible or not, but in the Bible, you know, they, they, they when they mention names, it's important. Mm -hmm. When they mention this, it's important. Right. Okay. Questions on that, guys? I think that's probably what I've seen a lot of people have trouble with because that seems a little out of the ordinary and we're so used to um, working on that feeling action kind of thing. That's a code of ethics question. Okay. Number 32, a student worker is, is supervising a student intern and would like to ensure the intern considers the social work core values, the, the social work core values in all agency decision making. The best method for the student to learn about these values is, okay, and this is the best. So when it's the best question, that means there's more than one right answer. And um, we have to pick out the best answer. Okay, let's take a shot at this one. A, read the agency's policies and procedure manner, manner. B, speak to the employees of the agency about their experiences. C, review the professional code of ethics. Or D, um, receive regular supervision to discuss clinical issues and progress. What's the best way to learn about these values? About a C, anybody else want to chime in? Can it possibly be A too? I would say A. Okay. So read the agency's policies and procedures manual. What did it have to do with the code of ethics? Oh, nothing really. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. And, okay, and then speak to someone else. Did someone say B? Yeah. I did. Speak to the employees of the agency about their experiences. Does that have anything to do with the code of ethics? I would say C. Actually. Read them. Yeah. Read them. Exactly. Just read them. Okay. You're taking a test. The test will have the code of ethics. What would I suggest to you? Read them. <laughs> Let's go and read them. <laughs> okay. So again, that's the best. So yes, I could speak to other people. Um, uh, let's see here. I was going to tell you some of the myths I've heard about the code of ethics. Um, you can only take um, a gift if it's under $25. Has anybody ever heard that? Yes, 15 and 30. That is not true, and it's not written in the Code of Ethics. There's actually no money value, actually. No, there's not. And the Code of Ethics says we should not. However, if it's detriment to our client, then we don't. I mean, we do. So the question on the test is, is, not, is never an absolute no. Okay? So it really is making sure that you know what the Code of Ethics says. Okay? So that one is C. Okay? A, 
A social worker completes a sexual history with an adolescent client. The social worker asks about the number of partners that she has been with and the methods, if any, that she is using to prevent pregnancy and sexual transmitted diseases. The social worker then puts a sexual history in the client's file. The social worker supervisor would consider this sexual history to be inappropriate because, okay, let's go back before we read the answers. She completes a sexual history with an adolescent client. She's adolescent, so I'm thinking she's probably 12 or 13. The social worker asks about the number of partners she has she has had and the methods, if any, mm -hmm. she's using pregnancy and, and, and sexual transmitted diseases. The social worker then puts the sexual history in the client's file. The social worker supervisor would conduct would consider it inappropriate consider the social history to be inappropriate because before you answer the question, what are your thoughts? Is that hmm. legal? Ah, okay. I'm just thinking that was kind of um... that's that doesn't sound legal to me. Well, I don't think it's illegal if the mom was there. It doesn't say the mom was there, so it doesn't it doesn't say that. Okay. Or, or ethical, more is what I'm. Thinking. Yeah, yeah, probably not ethical. Probably not ethical. I would agree with that. Okay, so there's something wrong here. We definitely got that part. Okay, so now that we recognize there's something wrong with that, then what do we think is the biggest wrong? A, included PH, PHI with about sexual transmitted diseases. B, was placed in adolescent's clients folder instead of separately se stored separately. C, lacked inf important information about the gender of her partners and sexual practices. And D, should have been completed by another professional who is licensed in this area. I would, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say. D because that, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, she's asking her about methods and her partners and telling her how to prevent pregnancies. Uh, if there's any, if she's using to prevent um, sex, I would think a medical doctor would be seeking that type of information. Um, you know, if she's working, I mean, I'm, again, I'm not assuming we're not assuming anything, but we probably need to. Would it not be correct that she's working and this would be her job? Medical, yeah. I mean, if she's asking these questions, would that not be her job? It doesn't say that particular, but. So wouldn't it be A, because I thought, isn't there something about us disclosing HIV or anything like that in a file? Per se? Not, not anymore. There used to be. That was oh. so all information is PHI now. Everything. You have to sign a release of HIPAA for everything. I mean, back in the day there used to be. There really was that um if if you're my age, when we first got, you know, first realized HIV, we'd put it like in a separate folder and it was green right. or bright orange, everybody would know they had it. Um, but now we to treat everybody the same. So all information is protected health information. Okay. Yeah. You used to have to give a consent to get an HIV. Yeah, so. not now. It's so different. So I think I'm going to. You'll be surprised with the answer. Yeah, it is C. Oh, if you wow. ask her all the information about her sexual partners, shouldn't you ask the gender? Um. Answer is C. Well, the gender of a partner. Mm. I would have What's, what, Why would we do that? Mm. I was actually thinking. Too. I mean, to determine if she's um, you know, the LGBT or. Yes. Okay. So if we don't ask, are we not showing some gender and some sort of sexual orientation bias? Yeah. Yeah, we're assuming that she's straight. We're assuming that she's a heterosexual, um, and that's bias. And you'll see a lot of those questions because a the, lot of the things in the DSM, this the, the DSM five talks about the awareness of of, of sexual orientation and and um, the the many gender roles, the binary that you can be. So a lot of the questions are on this. So anybody who's taken it recently have seen any of these, or didn't realize that you've seen any of these. <laughs> No, this was not asking so much. Um, yeah, and then you might not have realized it because if you'd picked any of the others, you would have never thought about the gender practices, right? Nope. No. Okay. And this is so uh, it's the gender role. So if, if I'm asking someone about their sexual history, okay, then I'm asking all of the questions, including 
Who are what, the sex of your partners? The gender of your partners? Who are you sleeping with? No, I can't assume anymore that everyone's heterosexual. I have a question. Uh huh. Would you think the client would feel um, that was kind of rude? Um, I am asking what sexual diseases she's had and how many people she's had she's been had sex with. I've already mm -hmm. asked her all the other questions. But um, when is the gender? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I so mean, we it, as. It, as social workers now, we really cannot assume that everyone is heterosexual. That is bias, and that is unethical. Mm. Okay, so that that's the there's a whole new and the DSM five talks about the whole area of the new areas of of, of gender roles and or in sexual orientation. Um, so that that's why it's C. Okay, and I, I think probably there are probably a lot more questions out there like this, and you just didn't know what it was. No, I didn't. Okay, does that make sense? <laughs> <I'm getting it. laughs> okay. Number 34. Can you see that? It's on two pages. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Okay. During acc acculturation, what is acculturation, and how is it different than assimilation? Anybody? Oh gosh. <laughs> I, I hate this one. Corporation. What is that? Assimilation mm. is the same. Okay. Right? You're you're come on. Acculturation is adding different things. Okay. So a culture. I'm adding a culture to my culture. I'm not losing my culture, though. I'm just adding a culture to my culture. Acculturation. Okay. Assimilation is I'm losing more of my culture because I want to be as similar as everybody else. Okay. So acculturation and assimilation. Okay. Mm. So then, during acculturation, which of the following statements describes the responsibilities of those in the dominant and non-dominant culture? Okay. A, individuals in both the majority and minority have equal responsibility to change in order to work together cooperatively. B, individuals in the majority group must teach those the minority about their customs and traditions. C, individuals in the minority must advocate for inclusion to ensure equal access to societal rewards by those in the majority. Or D, individuals in the minority must decide which majority practices they follow for integration to occur. Okay, let me hear some, some thoughts, some feedback, some guesses, some questions. Mm. I don't bite. I promise I don't. Did you say I don't get it? Uh, no, uh, I'm lost with that. <laughs> okay, I was going to say thank you for saying that because that's a pretty complicated one. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank it, you. Uh, that's that's <laughs> okay. some of the ones um, that kind of like whether this yes. was not the very word. <laughs> I've never seen it before. Exactly. I, I think you're not the only one. So thanks for saying something. Okay. Yeah. So during acculturation, um, and most often it, it happens everywhere, but most often we're talking about acculturation into the United States or the typical white society, okay? So most often it's what the question's asking me. So then I've got um, acculturation is happening, okay? The dominant culture is, is the majority. So again, in America, it's white Americans. And the non-dominant culture can be black, white, Asians, whatever, okay? So that's what those terms mean, okay? So... So A is asking me, individuals in both the majority, which is the, the white people and the minority, we'll use Asians for this question, have equal responsibility to change, um, to change in order to work together cooperatively. Is that true? B, individuals in the majority group, the white people, must teach those minority, the Asian people, about their customs and traditions. C, individuals in the minority, the Asians, must advocate for inclusion to ensure equal access to societal rewards. Societal rewards, that just means what the majority of the white people get, okay? And D, in individuals in the minority, the Asians, must decide which white practices they want to, they, they will follow 
for integration to occur. Okay, so this is during acculturation, when I'm adopting a new culture, which of these statements is true? I had to guess, I would say D. You would be right. Very good. Can you tell us how you got there? Because they're adding to their culture, so they want to decide what they want to incorporate into their culture. Perfect. That that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Okay. So minority and majority, um, you know, you, whatever uh, works for you to replace in your head. Um, so in this country, the majority are, are um, you know, um, Caucasian white Americans. That's the majority. So the minority could be Hispanics. It could be Asians. It could be, you know, anyone you choose to put in that box. Does that help you understand the question? Yes. Okay. And then acculturation, you have to know that term. So acculturation is adding a culture. Okay. Gotcha. I got Good. it. Yes. Culture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so number 35, a social worker who was recently hired by a large agency sees the services are delivered in a very bureaucratic manner that employees are the lowest organizational levels, having their task overseen by supervisors who in turn are overseen by managers. This is also a strong expectation that workers perform tasks according to a specific procedure designed to maximize the level of service. This agency is acting off what principles? Okay, so does, does everybody know the X and the Y theory? Mm. Very little. I do now. <laughs> I do now. Please explain. <laughs> <laughs> you must have a good tutor. <laughs> I know. She's awesome. <laughs> Theory X is like, um, it's the one that everybody hates to do. So it's what the boss wants you to get done. So it's kind of like what the boss says goes. And then Theory Y is like, you say you look at it as like the yes, the employees like this one because it's more of management supporting them. Very good. So now do you know which one of these human relations or scientific management is theory X and theory Y? I knew it wasn't contingency. I knew it wasn't systems. It's A. So A would be theory Y, it human relations. Oh, which is C which? would okay. be scientific management. That would be X. Okay. Does everybody hear? Did everybody understand what she was talking about? Do we know what X and Y theory is? Never heard of it. Okay, so let me I, show I've you. I've heard we vaguely. <laughs> okay, um, so that's most often on the test, and this is one of those program management questions um, that people sometimes have difficulty with. So let me just kind of minimize my screen. Show you. So if you have one of the APGAR books, um, and if you're studying like TDC, um, I think this stuff is in there newer, but it hasn't always been in there. But these are pro they're, they're management questions, but they're program management. Um, so that's where this information comes from. I wrote okay. down the page number. It was 271. Okay. And 272. So that's in the, the, the <laughs> clinical book or the green book? Uh, you were doing it with the practice test. I'm not sure. I think you were using it. Master's test. Um, the, the, so if it's the master's test, it's the green one. If it's not, it's the. We were using yeah, no that because we were doing um pocket prep yesterday, weren't we? Yeah, I actually have it in front of me. Let okay. me look at it. Okay. So anyway, this is theory X and theory Y. Okay. So these are things that you would need to know. Okay. So what she said, theory X, that is the one that is the very um what we're used to that system of bureaucracy. Um, things get done faster in Theory X because the boss tells everybody what to do. There are tight controls. There's, there's no, we don't want the people to get any better. We want them to make their widgets and be happy. That's a typical um, scientific management bureaucracy system. That's what that one is. Theory Y is a human relations theory. So the management supports the people on the bottom. So the people on the top are my workers. Okay, Barbara, um, this is so on the test, <laughs> so on the test, and I'm sorry that you haven't heard it, and I'm glad that you were in session today, because <laughs> this is, I've, I've not seen, I mean, have you not, did you, maybe didn't recognize it on the test? Mm -mm. 
Yeah, because it's almost always on there. Uh, Barbara, and you've just never, you don't think you didn't understand or you don't think you saw it? Mm. I, I, I probably saw it, but didn't know what it was. Okay. So that's what that's because so this is theory X and theory Y. And again, the other terms are human relations. Um, so the human relations, of course, is the people. That's the people system. And see, uh, the Y. I like to say the management's kind of holding up the people. Mm. Okay. And theory X, ugh, awful, awful, awful. Okay. And but theory X is the one that gets the most work done. So if the question asks who what works the best, it is theory X. Okay. Mm. So that's what's important. Also know that. Um, the contingency theory is like your backup plan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we're going over that question right now, Barbara. That was the one that we're going over. I just want to explain that to you. So this is a very typical question. Okay. The contingency plan is, is just mainly known as your backup plan. Okay. So let's go back and read the question again. Now that, you know, systems theory, that's family systems theory we talked about already, how things, you know, go together, link together. So, a social worker was recently hired by a large agency, sees that the services are delivered in a very bureaucratic manner, with employees at the lowest organization level having their task overseen by supervisors. Before I read any more, which theory is that? The one you just were talking about. X or Y? Um, is that X? X, and X is C. X is scientific management theory, okay? Human relations is why, because we care about people, okay? So I know it's systems because the way it tells me. There is also a strong expectation that workers perform tasks according to specific procedures designed to maximize service. Which one of those gets the most done? X or Y? X. X. X gets the most done. You get no say-so. You get no input. You do exactly what you're told to do. Okay. Um, Barbara, this is uh, Barbara, 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 Barbara. Okay. Yep, this is the LMSW. Exam. This is um, program management. Uh, um, and if you have the Abgar book, it's, um, I know it's chapter eight in the, one of the editions of the green book. Um, but it's, uh, this is program management. This is tests from APGAR. And it's an LMSW. Okay. So I promise you I tutor all the time. And I wouldn't tutor you that it wouldn't be on the test. I promise you. Okay. <laughs> I wouldn't. I do this. So just because you haven't heard it means that there's a problem. Because you should have heard it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there are two clues in there. When I tell you all the time that the answers are in the questions, there are two huge clues. They're designed to maximize the level of service as well as they get no say-so. That tells me that it's the, that's an awful bureaucratic system. Okay? So, questions on that one? I'm sure, I'm sure I rocked your boat there. I do apologize. Um, I will send you this whole book if you want. Do you not have, Barbara, you, what are you studying from? Which APGAR? Green one. Okay, I'm gonna put my green one. And it is, um, does it have um, second edition on there or first edition? If it doesn't have anything, it's the first edition. And it, it's not in there, I think. So look on your book, what does it say? Doesn't say, sorry, I'm in and out, my kids are here. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't say anything, then it's not in your book. The second edition, it has it. And the second edition, it's um, chapter eight. Yeah, it doesn't say anything. I must have the first edition. Okay. You have the first edition. So then you're, you're studying from not the newest information. Okay. Um, and I do have this book, as you see, on, on um, uh, there. And I will gladly send you the book. No problem. Actually, I think I have chapter eight set aside because a lot of people didn't have it. Um, so this is what you're missing. Does that make sense now while you're struggling with the test? No, I guess, ma'am. <laughs> but I also okay. have TDC. I've never heard this before, and I've been through that program twice. I have social um, work. I, 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 I cannot tell you. I can tell you it is in Dawn Apgar's book. I can tell you it's on the test. 
So I, I can't speak for other tutors. I can just tell you that my students pass. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, mm. it's in there. <laughs> Pam, I'm looking at E, but I don't see. Do you have section? Uh, the sec do you have the second edition? Yes. Okay. So look on chapter chapter eight. Maybe I'm looking for it to be that little thing that you just showed us, and no, it's no, no, not no, no. exactly it does. like that. No, 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 it does. Okay. It, it just talks about. Um... Okay, interview um, interventions with larger accesses, methods of delivery system. Let me look at the front of my book where it talks about it. Okay, moderate organizational approaches on page 255. And 254 talks about classical, 254, it says, um, the scientific management theory, theory X. Okay, yeah, I see, it. I see it. Between 254 and that book. Thank you. I, I swear I didn't make it up. <laughs> I, didn't. I didn't write the test, nor do I make it up. I can just tell you what's on there. <laughs> Okay, I think that's probably an eye opener for a lot of people. Um, and again, if you're using older material, you might not have this in there. What okay. color is the new edition one? It's the same, it's green. It just says second edition on the bottom. Okay. Okay, so she has a couple of books out there. Um, so the, I use all of them actually. I use the, um, the blue ones, which are her clinical level. She's got an ASWB AG, which is a maroon color. And then I also use the bachelor level one. Um, so I pull from everything. Um, what I realized also when I, I didn't realize this until I began tutoring is a lot of my students did not have a BSW. So they I had to go back and pick up some of the BSW stuff to make sure they could pass the test. Um, so that's why I have all the material and I will gladly send it to you. Um, but if you're taking the test over and over again, it's, you're, you're just missing some pieces. Does that, does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> okay, and I'm not trying to, I'm never will talk about it, about any other program that is not, that is not what I'm here to do. My goal is just to help you see what you're missing and pass this test. Okay. So now that I explain it to you, when you know those pieces, do you understand how easy 35 is? Yeah. Yeah, because mm -hmm. both there's two clear sentences in there that talks about exactly what it is. Yes. Okay. Um, and if you will remind me to text me, I will, I will gladly, um, I've got an electronic copy of this book and I will gladly send you the book. I would like to have one. <laughs> yeah, if you will just, um, at the end of this, at the end, of, or in the text box, just put it in there. And um, it's actually on my Google Drive, so I have to, I'll send you a link to my Google Drive, but you're more than welcome to have a copy. Sure, thank you. No problem, no problem. Okay. It's, I'm, I'm not trying to hoard all the information. <laughs> <Nor are you. laughs> mm. Which of the following is not true about the distinction between grief and depression? Okay. So A, painful feelings caused by grief come in waves while mood and ideation, which are almost constantly negative, are associated with depression. B, Feelings of worthlessness, suicidal ideations, and impairment of overall function are symptoms of grief rather than depression. C, when grief and depression coexist, grief is more severe and prolonged than grief without depression. Or D, in grief, self-esteem is usually preserved while corrosive feelings are wor of worthlessness and self-loathing are more or more common when depressed. Okay, so this is a not statement. Those confuse a lot of my students. So what I suggest you do is find the three that are true and tell me um, the one that you think then is not true based on elimination. So tell me about grief and depression. Okay. I want to take a stab at it. Are you all mad at me and hung up? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Is maybe B not true? Okay, so let's see here. Let's I'm start. not mad at all, actually, uh, Miss Pam. I'm actually um now I'm blaming the book that I'm studying. I'm <laughs> on my fifth attempt. And apparently, I'm studying the wrong stuff. I'm not just not the newest stuff. How about that? Just not the newest. I'm like, and and. Well, social like everything it changes it just changes 
And when you when you go ahead, you're welcome. When you take the test and there are questions on there that you you haven't quite studied yet, those are just preparing you for the next for the next test. Mm -hmm. So what I really ask you is after you take the test, when you and, and I'm not asking you right word for word, but when you're done, if you will share with me things that you had never seen before, and that way I make sure my newer students are getting the newest information. Okay. Because what happens is most of us, you know, we don't always keep up. I, I teach college, so I, I have to keep up. I have to make sure my students are getting the latest and greatest information. Um, but many times we just don't keep up with what's changing. And like anything in the field, it changes often, right? That's exactly what I do. At, like as I'm going, if there's words or something, I don't, I'm like, I never even seen this before. So then it I'll, changed. Yeah. So, that, so when I get home, I'm like, I don't, and then I'll look, but I still don't find it. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm losing something like. Sometimes I think I'm losing my mind, but apparently you're not. <laughs> you're not, you're not, you're not, okay? <laughs> but I do ask you to please take notes and just, it's not for me. It's paying it forward to my future people who are coming along so I can just give them the very best of, of, that I can give them, okay? So let's go to rule out here. So D, in grief, self-esteem is usually preserved while corrosive feelings of worthlessness and self-loathing are more common when depressed. Is that true or false? So in grief, self-esteem is usually preserved. Is it not? When you when you're in grief, you don't think you're awful, do you? Mm. No. Somebody's just your no. side. So that one, that one, it, I don't think that's true. I mean, I think that is true, right? In grief, my self-esteem is preserved. That's true. C. When grief and depression coexist, grief is more severe and prolonged than grief without depression. That's definitely true. If I already have some, some depression going on and I'm grieving, definitely. Okay. Um, a, painful feelings cause, oh, I'm sorry, B, feelings of worthlessness, suicidal ideations, and impairment of overall functions are symptoms of grief rather than depression. Is that true or false? It's false. It is false. True. Feelings of worthlessness, suicide ideas, and uh, impairment of overall function are symptoms of grief. They're symptoms of depression. Exactly. They're not symptoms of grief. No, so that's that false. is not true. That is not true. Okay. And that's why I have to read those also very carefully because there's lots of these you'll get. Okay. And pain feelings caused by grief come in waves while mood and ideation, which are almost constant negative, are associated with depression. So the one that's not true is B. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 37. We'll get a little bit easier, guys. I promise. <laughs> Upon asking closed-in questions instead of open-ended questions. Um, questions, uh, well, instead of asking closed-in questions, um, instead of open-ended questions, assist social worker with. Why would I ask um, open-ended questions? Assist, assist me with what? What part of my job? A, ensuring the clients are in charge of the helping process. B, focusing the social work, um, the social work interview. C, learning how positive experiences have been perceived. Or D, uh, using positive regard in the problem-solving approach. Which one of these? A. Are my, are my clients in charge of the helping process? Mm-mm. I'm not a social worker. Asking, okay, I'm sorry. So I'm asking closed into questions instead of open into questions. Closed into questions are what? Oh, I misread it. See? Yes. <laughs> no. yeah, exactly, exactly. Opening questions are? One. More information. <laughs> yes. Tell me about your day. Yes. That's it. Okay. So uh, asking questions, clients closed into questions instead of open into questions, assist the social worker with what? How does that help me? Well, isn't it B? Because it's very focused. Exactly. And especially when I'm just trying to get that demographic information, like where do you live? I, I, I can't, I gotta get that quickly, right? Exactly. That works. Good job. Yes. 
Wow. So this one is um, a, a culture question. Okay. A client who's a member of an African-American tribe states he is too spirited during an assessment. This information likely means, okay, so you'd have to know a little bit about Afri I'm sorry, American, American Indian um, culture. So does anybody have any idea what this means? Too spirited? So my, um, Afri my American Indian tribes believe that they have both masculine and feminine parts. That's part of their spiritual identity. Um, so again, they believe they're part of the earth and, um, you know, mother, mother tree or father earth. It, it doesn't matter. They, they believe they both have part of their, their spirituality is both male and female interactions. Okay. So well, you wouldn't know that if you didn't know anything about the African American, right? I'm sorry, the Native American. The answer to that one is D. Okay. Would anybody have picked that? What else would you have chosen? Would everybody know that already? Okay. We'll do one I probably, Go ahead. No, I was just there, I probably wouldn't have picked D. Yeah, I probably would have picked A. Yeah. <laughs> and that's that's just knowledge base. That's just knowledge base. And I, I, there's not enough to, you know, enough to go and learn everything about every culture. So thank goodness there are only a few questions on there. <laughs> so that's, uh, I hear there are more and more cultural questions um, these days and more and more, uh, you know, about program management. A lot of my students who come to me have, have, are, uh, I hear they're missing this, that whole chapter eight, that whole um, um, indirect approach those program management, the community stuff, that's what I hear most of my students miss a lot on. And I think it's again, because of the, the study source. Okay, we'll do one more. We're gonna wrap it up for tonight. Um, uh, Jordy, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, um, so. A couple in their mid-50s makes an appointment to see a social worker due to recent sexual dysfunction. During the first session, they report that they have, uh, they have had, re they have had recently, that they have recently had a lot of life changes due to their children being in college. The husband reports decreased um, sexual desire um, that he has made intercourse, physical intercourse difficult. In this situation, a social worker should first, before you look at any of the answers, what is the answer to this question? He's 50 and he's having trouble getting an erection. Genital something? Sorry. Oh, I thought you were asking, like, what stage would he be in? No, what's what do you? It's the first question. So, what do you do first? We know that we assess, but what do I know about this? I would refer because you're out of your scope of practice. Refer because. You want to rule out medical. Oh, that's what they make Viagra just for this question. <laughs> <laughs> See, Alice is written all over this question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is a medical issue first. It may not be. <laughs> but yes, this is a medical question. Okay. <laughs> so anyone, this is so first is always going to assess, right? But in my assessment, before I go through anything, yes, all this stuff is going on, but he's 50. He is 50. That is why the blue pill was made. Okay. Did you find tonight helpful? Yes. But I guess maybe. Yes, just confusing, yes. but I have a hard time with theories anyway. <laughs> oh, thank you. So um, I, I hope that we kind of went over some stuff and some stuff that helped you refresh your memory. I, I will not be here next Sunday. I'll be out of town. Um, so our following week will be um, on the um, whatever Sunday that is after that. I think it's the 27th. Um, I'll post it if you um, if you want again this will be recorded and I'll put it here um, if you um, 
it'll, again, you'll, you'll have your recording. So look over it again and again and again. Um, again, if you have other people in your um, in your circle who are in the same place as you, you know, invite them to the study group. It's very reasonably priced um, and it really does make a big difference of really having sometimes I think and for me, I, I need a teacher. I need someone to explain things to me. And I think that um, um, it's a, a valuable. Most of my students do. I haven't had a student who's retaken the test after I've tutored them, not one. Wow. So, um, well, I mean, I, I can, especially my individual one, I, I spend time with you. I know what you, I know you, I know what you're missing. I can figure out, you know, what parts you're, you're missing. So I can't promise you in my group sessions, but my individual students, I have not had anyone not pass. And if I tell you, if I think you're not ready, I'll tell you too. I'll just say, hey, <laughs> stop wasting your money. So the questions are the questions. They really, and I don't mean to minimize it, but they're, once you get it, they're not that hard. Okay. So have a great week. Um, again, if um, I do have some openings for um, some private sessions, if you're interested, feel free to email me. Be sure to follow me on Facebook. I always post um, information and questions. Um, anything exciting that I learn, I always share, and I appreciate you guys sharing with me. So I will see you in two weeks. Um, if not, if unless I see you sooner than that. Okay. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Bye. Thank you much.